Okay, well, welcome everyone to the virtual NRTRC and Telehealth Alliance of Oregon Telehealth Conference and this session on finding and securing grant funding. And our thanks to the sponsors on the screen that have made this conference possible. And my slides are not advancing. There we go. Uh, both audio and video are muted during the session for all participants. Uh, you can use the Q&A feature to ask questions. I will read questions to our speaker as time allows. Uh, all the questions submitted will be recorded, as will this session, and will be available along with the PowerPoint presentation slides later on the NRTRC website. Uh, my name is Chris Tamron, and I will be the moderator. I am with the State of Oregon Business Development Department, Oregon Broadband Office, and I'm also a founding board member of the Telehealth Alliance of Oregon. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon and this evening for some of you. Uh, we have 1,100 people attending the conference from 43 states. I'm sorry that you could not all be with us here in Oregon today. Uh, the landscape behind me is in Eastern Oregon. Um, in addition to disrupting the plans for an untold number of conferences this spring, the COVID-19 crisis is shining a new light on the continuing digital divide and on broadband as essential infrastructure needed to enable and support telework, distance, distance education, and telehealth applications that are being used to contain the pandemic. Uh, we have some long established federal funding programs that support broadband infrastructure and equipment and telehealth strategies to, to deliver clinical healthcare services um, we are now seeing funding allocations increase for some of those programs, and we're seeing additional programs being created and proposed in response to the accelerating demand for broadband connectivity to support telehealth. This afternoon's session will look at ways uh, to find and secure grant funding for telehealth projects, and we are fortunate to have Dana Satterwhite with us today. Uh, Dana is a grant consultant at Learn Design Apply Incorporated, and she has worked in the field for 10 years specializing in finding funding for technology initiatives. Uh, welcome, Dana. Thank you so much. Let me pop my slides up here. All right, thank you all so much for having me and thank you all for joining so late in the afternoon. Um, my original presentation was titled Tips and Tricks to Getting the Grant. Um, I did amend this slightly because before uh, COVID-19, I was just going to talk more generally about grant funding and strategies around finding grant funding and pursuing grant funding. Um, but I thought everyone might benefit more if I spent time talking about grants in general, but then actually focus on some current grant programs that are out right now for telehealth uh, specifically for telehealth technologies uh, in response to COVID-19. Uh, and please bear with me as some of these programs are brand new as of this week. And in fact, one was released several minutes ago that I am aware of. And so I am learning as fast as I can. Um, and my job is uh, to be a resource to you all and hopefully share information. Um, but if I don't have the answer today, I will do my very best to get back to you on some of this, these new programs. So here's a quick agenda of what we'll cover today, who I am and, and what our organization does, and then we'll focus more of our time on two specific grant programs that are out right now um, that are directly in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As Chris mentioned, I'm with an organization called Learn, Design, Apply. We are a grants consulting and management company. Um, our team has extensive experience in grant managing, uh, writing, program development, um, and we specifically focus on technology grants, though we are not limited to technology grants. It's how we were started, and so that is the foundation upon which we were built. Um, and we have a strong focus specifically in distance learning and telehealth tel and telemedicine. These are some of our service offerings, as well as our website, if you want to explore uh, what we do a little bit more in depth. But Essentially, we can be as involved in the grant process as you want us to be, whether that's just providing information on where to find funding and what funding is available that aligns with your organization's needs and goals. 
um, to walking you through an entire grant application um, beginning to end and through the reporting and implementation phases as well. We also support Poly, which is a video conferencing manufacturer and audio manufacturer. Um, we are a dedicated resource to them as well to specifically look for grants that fund the technology that lends itself naturally to what they do and what they manufacture. So specifically for today, um, that would be in the telehealth field as well as some distance learning applications. So I'll go ahead and get started more generally about grants. And this is true for all kinds of grants, not just telehealth. It's not so much about the specific technology as it is about how that technology addresses certain needs and what your application is. So while we have this background and experience in helping find funding for technology, it's very rare that a specific grant program would be all about that technology itself. It's far more focused on understanding who you are as an organization, who do you serve as an organization, and what challenges do you face. The technology is that means to an end. It's how you facilitate a, so, a solution and, and bring um, a benefit to the communities that you serve. So while the technology is absolutely important and it's important to understand what technology best suits your needs, understanding the communities that you serve, the patient demographics that you serve, and what your ultimate goals are and in addressing certain challenges you face, those are more important when looking at grant funding um, and pursuing it, especially in a competitive grant application. And our job as grant consultants is always to advise you to be as competitive as you can be. We will never tell you to go for a grant if we don't feel you can win that grant. So we always say avoid a square peg in a round hole situation where if this grant is not suited for you, we will be the first to tell you, but we will also look for funding that aligns with you um, far better than the grant. So while that takes patience, um, grants take time in general, it's so much better use of your time to wait for the right application to apply for rather than try to apply for everything. Grants take a significant amount of time and effort and resources between you and your organization and your community members. It is a better strategy to wait for the right grant um, that, that fits your organization, the priorities of the grant align with your priorities, um, and go for that. You have a far better chance of funding and you won't burn out applying to anything and everything and only winning one or two. So as I mentioned, I'm going to shift and kind of focus on two specific grant programs that are out right now. Um, the first, as many of you are probably aware of, there is through the FCC, the COVID-19 telehealth program. It um, is out right now, and I cannot stress enough how quickly I believe these funds will be going. So if you are interested in pursuing this program, um, it is to your benefit to, to start acting immediately. Um, this is one that just came out on Monday, and it's a brand new program that we have not seen before. Obviously, it's in response to the COVID-19 crisis. So this is one where I will try and answer questions that you may have about it, but I am learning, um, learning it as we go here and um, as trying to crash course right before this presentation to learn as much as I absolutely could, but I will get back to you with answers. Um, but basically, the, the priority of this grant is to provide funding to help healthcare providers with connected care services to patients at their homes or mobile locations in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. They are looking for this funding to be implemented immediately to eligible healthcare providers that are looking to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic through telecommunication services, information services, and any devices necessary that will help allow you to provide critical connected care services. These funds will be available until they run out or um, the time has, uh, the program has ended. So they have announced that this funding will be available through September. And as I mentioned before, I really think it's going to be gone much sooner than that. Um, I'll give you some more details. There's 200 million available. And, it, and as I mentioned, it's a rolling application. This funding is not competitive in that the application itself, it does not require much in the way of narrative development. It is more a matter of if you meet the eligibility criteria, and you're using the funds for immediate use in response to COVID-19. So that's a much more simple approach than most grant programs. This is truly just funds allocated to the purposes that they state for eligible entities. Eligible entities are limited to nonprofit and public eligible healthcare providers. 
there are some specific categories as you start looking into this program. And if you go to that website listed at the bottom, you can kind of drill down a little bit more to confirm your eligibility. But the key is to be nonprofit and or public um, agency healthcare provider. And again, when they ask you in the application about your intended time frame, their goal here is to roll these out immediately. And so the goal would be to be prepared to start your project as soon as you're able to receive the funds. And it's a reimbursement grant so, or a program, so you would be reimbursed for the funds that you spend right away. Here is a list of what they consider eligible services and devices. This is not the full list. These are just examples to give you an idea of the types of applications that they are looking to fund in this program. So telecommunications and broadband services, those are eligible for healthcare providers or patients. Um, information services like remote patient monitoring platforms and services, and then of course, internet connected devices and equipment, um, such as tablets or smartphones to connected devices, but also telemedicine carts for the healthcare provider sites. What we've been seeing a lot of um, with certain models providing to the home or con connected care programs would be a combination of some of these where it's telehealth equipment at the healthcare facilities with peripheral devices and then some of the smaller tablets or smaller mobile devices for um, home care and remote uh, either providers or patients. Here's a little bit more about the process and the eligibility. Um, there are some steps that must be taken to apply for this funding. Um, if you have participated in any of the FCC rural health programs, some of these steps have already made, you may have already done. Um, so if you already have, um, say, an FRN number, or you may already be kind of on to step two, but then you also need to make sure that you're registered with your system for award management or have a SAM registration, which is also required for many federal grants. So if you've applied for federal grants, chances are you have a SAM registration. You just need to make sure that it's active and has not expired. Um, but these are those first steps that you need to take in order to start the application process. And again, this is not an extensive, long narrative process. They really want you to go through the form and fill it out um, and make sure that you meet the eligibility criteria in order to um, be eligible to receive the funds. So it's simple once you do these registration steps and once you get through this process, the actual paperwork can be pretty straightforward and not take too much time. But again, I'm, uh, I will stress that if you are interested in this funding, um, act quickly. I, I think a lot of people are very interested in this funding um, and have been looking to pursue it. I will stop before I jump into the next program and just mention that we are hearing that there will be another FCC funding program announced likely in August. Um, this current program has 200 million available um, in total. You can request up to a million dollars. So if everybody who applies right away applies for the full amount. If you think about that, that's only 200 awards per, for the country. This second round that we're hearing about in August is only 100 million, also with a $1 million um, max. It's also available for both urban and rural. Um, it's not restricted to rural, but it, the next round will likely have a um, poverty requirement. So they will probably instate some form of um, measuring poverty as a requirement uh, to be eligible. We don't know much more than that at this point, but that's what we're hearing. So. In the event that you aren't able to pursue the current FCC funding, we are hearing there will be more. And I, I'd say the good news to take away from that is not just that there's more funding coming in August, but that there's a lot of um, activity around trying to put money toward responding to COVID-19 and telehealth equipment and technologies in general. So we are hopeful um, that we'll see more and more of it. But as of right now, from the FCC funding perspective, that is what we know about what's currently out and what we're expecting to see next. Next, I'll shift to a, a federal grant program that um, is through the USDA, and it's called the RUS DLT, which stands for Rural Utility Services Distance Learning and Telemedicine. This grant um, usually only has one round of funding. You'll note on the slide it says round two. Round one ended Friday, and they announced additional funding for round two, 
and that opened on Tuesday. So um, that's unusual for this grant program. Usually this program comes out once per year, but given um, the, they have found some additional funding um, because of COVID-19 that they have put into round two to fund more applications with the same priorities. So I'll go into this grant a, a little bit right now. So this program is um, intended to provide funding for interactive real-time distance learning or telehealth equipment. Um, the key here is real-time interactive distance learning or telehealth. The way that they define distance learning or telehealth is a live two-way interactive connection. Um, so it's not the one-way broadcasting or recording and streaming. It, it would need to be the one-to-one -one, um, or more interactive live connection point. It's also very much focused on equipment, and it does tend to favor projects that are hardware-based for equipment rather than lots of cloud software and licenses. You can include some of that, but just historically, this grant has been more focused on things like um, telehealth carts or systems or distance learning um, technology to go into classrooms. Here are the basics. So for round two, the due date will be July 13th. Originally, they were planning on doing a round two and just using funds carried over from round one. They just announced that they've added 25 million from the CARES Act because of COVID-19. So there is some additional funding. I have a feeling they, they did this also because round one probably received more applications than they anticipated. And so they probably were a little bit fearful there might not be much carried over from round one. Um, and so they did find some additional funding because they had um, associated this funding with COVID-19, that is going to be a portion of the special consideration priority um, for this grant. The points are still going to be awarded for one of the three categories, opportunity zone, substance abuse, or STEM education. But we're highly encouraging applicants to talk about their program in response to COVID-19, which Distance learning and telemedicine technology naturally does lend itself to that conversation anyway, as more and more organizations are trying to facilitate remote learning, um, keeping you know, the, the risk of exposure down, unnecessary hospital visits, those kinds of things. So it just takes a little bit of conversation for you to bring that piece of that conversation around COVID-19 into your project. So the program goal is to encourage and improve telemedicine and distance learning services specifically for rural areas through the use of telecommunications, computer networks, and technologies for distance learning and telemedicine organizations or content providers. The key here is rural. You're scored based on how rural the areas are that you serve and how underserved those populations are. So to be eligible and competitive for this grant, you do need to meet those two criteria. However, you as a lead applicant do not necessarily need to be in the most rural areas. You could be in an urban area and serve as a project hub, and you would need to serve identified rural communities to be eligible for this funding. Again, because a lot of this funding for round two um, is in response to COVID-19, we're advising all projects to discuss the ways that distance learning or telemedicine projects um, are in response to COVID-19 preparation or mitigation. This is similar actually to the FCC program we just talked about in that I think it, it is our first place to go when we think, oh, COVID-19, how do we connect to that? And you talk about if you're, if you're actually serving patients um, with COVID-19, and that is actually not the case. You don't have to directly impact patients with COVID-19 to be eligible for FCC funding or to have this area of focus. If you're doing anything um, to provide mitigation or prevention that helps keep people either away from the hospital or prevent exposure, whether it's at schools um, or certain specialty care that could be provided over telemedicine versus in person, those are all ways that you're helping mitigate and um, respond to COVID-19 by keeping um, hospitals more available for COVID-19 patients and also risking um, exposure when not necessary. So all of those would be applicable to a COVID-19 focus. 
So for this grant, there are very specific items that are eligible and not eligible. So here's a list of what you can put in your grant budget and what you cannot. As I mentioned, this grant tends to be very focused on hardware technology and endpoints. Um, capital expenditures, uh, again, you can include some software at licensing, but they must be capital expenditure purchases. Um, and you can spend some portion of your budget um, on broadband related expenditures, but that really should not be the focus of your grant project. Your focus should really be on the technology facilitating distance learning and telemedicine activities. But if you do need to include some broadband related expenditures, they need to be um, capital expenditures, not something like your monthly broadband fee. That is ineligible. They will allow some cloud services Given the way technology has progressed and what people are doing more commonly, they have allowed it, but you absolutely need to justify it and explain how those cloud services in your budget are specifically providing resources and services to the rural areas defined in your project. They don't want those to be shared across um, areas that don't meet the eligibility criteria as rural and underserved. Things like recurring expenses, indirect costs, um, and unrelated technology purposes that do not, um, that will not be dedicated for distance learning and telemedicine, those are all ineligible. Um, anything that uh, can be used for lots of other purposes outside of distance learning or telemedicine would be considered ineligible. Anything that's kind of like um, a PC or a tablet that you intend to dedicate for distance learning or telemedicine, you can include, but you need to justify and explain why those devices will be used specifically for those purposes. Um, because the nature of those devices is that they can be used for so many other things. So just be really careful about how you justify and, and position them in your applications. All right, this grant is wonderful in that almost everybody can apply. Um, it's actually easier for me to tell you who cannot apply, which would be a federal organization because this is a federal grant. Um, but basically a for-profit can apply, a nonprofit. Tribal entities, state and local organization, um, units of government, schools, hospitals, um, any, anybody really can apply as long as you're not federally funded or a sole proprietor. Um, you must have a DUNS number and an active SAM registration, which I mentioned in the previous um, FCC program. That SAM registration is easy to do, but you do need to do that very early on in case it takes some time to get your registration active. Um, a DUNS number as well. Those are things that you absolutely can do, especially before the July 13th deadline, but those would be things I would recommend you start with. Um, something to note about this grant is that there is a matching component. Projects have to hit a 15% match of the federal requested amount to be eligible. And the same rules apply for match as they do for federally funded items. So you can't match with things like personnel or, or salary hours, anything like that. It has to be um, eligible equipment or items that you would put in your grant budget. The same rules apply for your matching funds. And then again, that rural requirement, you must be in a rural area or serve rural communities. Um, you must hit a rurality score of at least 20 points. Um, and how they measure rurality in this grant is anybody, any community of 20,000 or more is considered urban. Any community under 20,000 is considered rural and you actually receive more points the more rural you are. So the most amount of points you get would be in communities of under 5,000. And then it's a sliding scale from five to 10,000, you get X amount of points. And then you have 10,000 to 20,000 in population. That's when you get 20 points. And so you need your average to be at least 20 points or higher to even be eligible for this grant. Something our team is very, very familiar with is the scoring process and we'd be more than happy to take a look at your locations that you serve and let you know how competitive you would be in this grant. So we would be um, glad to do that for you and, and run some numbers on demographics for you and let you know if, if this is a good fit for your organization. So here are just to get your mind kind of going and brainstorming about what kinds of projects we've seen and what's successful and what's out there. This is in no way uh, an exhaustive list. You could uh, think about this in any way possible of how your organization works and who you serve. But just to give you an idea of the types of projects that we've seen, 
we think distance learning and we think schools only, it does not necessarily need to be a school to school. This could be school-based health. You could be a teaching university medical school. Um, you could be doing training and education at a community center and doing um, education, nutrition education and healthcare education to community members. I mean, it really can be any form of distance learning. Similarly, telemedicine doesn't need to be clinical. It can be any form of connection like we're doing today where it's a live interactive connection and um, you're, you're sharing services of any sort that are healthcare related to be telemedicine. So it's a really broad definition. Um, and so you're, it's really open to kind of whatever your organization needs, as long as you're using the technology to provide some sort of distance learning or telemedicine service to the communities that meet the eligibility criteria, this is a good opportunity for you. I'll kind of zip through the rest of the slides so we make sure we have time for questions. But um, basically the, the starting point for this grant would be to understand what your project design looks like. What kinds of uh, services are you offering? Distance learning, telemedicine, or a combination of both? In the healthcare space, I actually see more of a combination of both because you talk about continuing education for your medical professionals. You talk about training, best practices. If you, if you serve multiple clinics, you're going to want to connect with people at each of those locations for um, trainings and uh, even remote patient consultations so you don't have to travel between those sites. So, um, combination is, is very common in this grant, even in the healthcare space. And then you don't want to just pick one problem or challenge. You want to try and see how many ways this technology can help benefit your communities, your patients, and benefit your organization. So you don't want to just say, oh, we'll just do telestroke. It's really beneficial if you can look at the technology and see how many different things you can start to integrate into your practices as an organization that will bring uh, more efficiencies, potentially safe costs, but also bring more to your communities. There are different kinds of models for this grant. I mentioned that traditional hub and spokes model where perhaps your hub is located in an urban area, but you're, you're serving your spoke clinics, maybe in rural areas. Maybe everybody in your project is located in rural areas, so you would be all providing services and, and care between your sites. That would be more like a hub end user to a hub end user. Everyone has the same site designation. Um, and then there are a couple of other types of projects that are a little less common, um, but you could be a non-fixed project where a lot of organizations who are looking at some more mobile devices going into an area where they want to be able to move those devices all around a dedicated service area, that would be called a non-fixed project. To be eligible for that though, your hub does need to be in a qualifying rural area. So you could not do that urban hub um, model in a non-fixed application. And then hybrid would be a combination where you have some non-fixed service areas identified and some fixed sites. Again, starting with your registrations, that's key. Those can take some time. So if you are interested in applying for this grant, I would make sure that you have these registrations. We're happy to help you with that if you don't know. And then here's how the scoring breaks out. And I'll just touch on this, that your objective scoring is that piece I said I'm happy to help you with. That's based on your demographics and the locations you're serving. That's set from the very beginning. So we would know that going into the application, how many points you would be getting from that portion of the scoring because it's all based on locations and demographics. In your subjective scoring, there are several sections to this grant that are narratives. However, the only one that is scored is your needs and benefits where you talk about what needs are you addressing? And how are you benefiting the communities that you're proposing to serve? Again, lots of stuff in this grant to unpack. I didn't wanna take too much time and I wanna save some time for questions, um, but my contact information is listed here. I'm happy to open the floor up for questions. And then if you have specific questions about your project, or your organization, I would be happy to field those via email. Okay, I have my uh, back one. There we go. Uh, we do have a question, Dana, uh, regarding regarding the COVID nineteen telehealth grant program. Um, does that include the funding for mental health services? It does, as long as you're an eligible nonprofit organization. 
and it absolutely does. You would just want to talk about um, in the in the application. There are some sections to talk about how the equipment or telehealth technologies that you're requesting budget for will be used, and if they're patient um, or provider use, or, and then how are they in response to COVID-19. So you would just want to include a small justification piece of how um, your project is in response to COVID-19. But yes. Okay. Uh, also, for these uh, federal funding programs, they can be really complex and, and uh, moving through the application process. So, uh, one, how do I find professional help? And then what is that, what's going to be the uh, approximate cost of getting question. professional help for, for grant writing and, and grant applications? Sure. So, if you have the, the luxury of having an internal grant writer, um, that helps a lot, obviously, because an internal resource will know your organization better than somebody on the outside. However, there are amazing professional grant writing resources um, that you can hire to write this grant. And our team has worked on this grant specifically for a very long time, and we have a really wonderful database of grant writers that we would be happy to introduce. Um, so feel free to reach out, and I'd be happy to connect you with grant writers specifically that have experience with these grants. Um, I will say the cost varies. It depends on the scope of your project, how involved you can be, if you have significant content you can provide. I would say anywhere from six to 10,000 is a fair estimate or range to give. But again, it, it, everything varies depending on your experience in the project, so. Okay. Uh, is it smart to talk about the future use of equipment yes. beyond COVID? Yes, absolutely. I would say, um, especially if you're looking at the FCC program, because the funds um, are just through September at this point, you will have to figure out, you know, if you're doing something like um, software licensing or a service that you pay for on a monthly basis, you will have to figure out how you're going to cover those costs after this funding. Um, however, if you're purchasing equipment that you would then own, being able to say you're, you're using this equipment and it will be used for the future and we'll be able to expand on a telehealth network, absolutely. And then especially for the REST DLT grant, that's a three-year grant program, so you absolutely want to talk about the full extent that you can use the equipment, not just through the duration of the grant, but beyond. Are there any uh, grant application, you know, completed grant applications that are available to look at as examples or models for how to, um, to complete an application? Sure. Most organizations would be happy to share executive summaries. Um, and then on a case by case basis, I'm sure we can connect you with previous awardees if they are willing to share their complete applications. Um, probably what we would want to do is have a conversation to understand what your project goals are or what the type of project you're looking at doing so that we could find something similar for you to look at as an example. Okay, and I think uh, finally, is there a good place to go to find what telehealth funding programs are currently available? Yes, um, there are several organizations and, and federal agencies that regularly release um, funds. Grants.gov is a good platform in general to subscribe to. You can kind of filter which grants you want to be notified about. It's big and so you'll get lots of notifications. So um, definitely use that filter feature. Um, but organizations like HRSA, SAMHSA, um, the USDA actually has quite a few. Um, and then FCC is coming out with more. We also see certain state programs that have initiatives. So it's a little tricky to kind of say there's a one-stop shop outside of uh, grants.gov where you can look at the federal register to see what's announced. Our team is always closely monitoring grants that have this kind of focus. We'd be happy to include you. Usually what we do when we see a grant that has a telehealth focus, we put together a summary document about the grant and then we, we send it out to anybody who might be interested. So you're also welcome to contact me and I can um, add you to that informational list. Okay, well, I think that brings us to the bottom of the hour. I'd like to quickly mention that the uh, Oregon Broadband Office is working with a local non-for-profit OCHIN, O-C-H-I-N, to assist rural providers to, uh, to find uh, uh, funding for uh, support and programs. So if you happen to be a uh, rural healthcare provider in Oregon, uh, reach out please to OCHIN, O-C-H-I-N.org, or you can find me at broadband.oregon.gov. And I think with that, thank you very much for attending the session.